This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today I'm joined by a businessman who rededicated his life to Christ in his 60s and now dedicates his life to telling young people that what you believe and your moral ethics matter. Tom Lewis created a multi-million dollar home building business in Arizona and despite all his accomplishments and philanthropy, he found that something was missing in his life. Thank you for being with us. Author of Solid Ground, you had a company that was really cooking out in Phoenix, then you sold it. Uh, what happens after that? I mean, that's a busy, busy, busy life to maintain it, to build and maintain a company like that. Yeah, and you know, it almost reminds me a little bit of COVID today because, uh, you know, if you're running a company that's just booming, we, we thought that the Phoenix housing market never stopped. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was up to about 60,000 new home permits a year. And uh, we literally thought this would go on forever. Wow. And then all of a sudden, uh, the, the uh, 2008 financial crisis mm -hmm. hit, and um, our sales went to zero. And our banks cut off our financing, wow. and uh, we had to lay off. We had 140 employees. We had to lay off 100. And so we okay. kept our best 40 employees. And that really allowed us to keep the morale up, oddly enough, mm -hmm. in a time like that. But it was a crisis. It was a total crisis. And we had to hunker down. And uh, fortunately, we had made enough money and profits during the good days to pay off all of the debt, which was the smartest thing I ever did. Mm -hmm. And then we could do the smart thing to get through it. I actually got depressed when I was uh, at the peak of this success. And we were making so much money, couldn't believe it. And uh, I felt like I had gotten to the top of the mountain that I'd been climbing my whole life. And the view wasn't as good as I thought. <laughs> you uh -huh. know? I mean, I, I'd, been, I'd been seeking success and wealth and admiration my entire life. And, uh, you know, to be honest, and I think most very successful uh, people would share that uh, with you in confidence, you know, that, that's really kind of think how, how it works. But, but then when you achieve that, you realize it's not what you thought it was. It's not really fulfillment. And, um, and then uh, about that same time, I found out that I had cancer. And uh, wow. it was a melanoma on my right tricep. My dad had died of melanoma when he was 66. And I was 67 at the time. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I was about 66. Five, 64, 64 five. yeah. And uh, so my world totally stopped. But you had already started, you and your wife Janet started a foundation years before that. So you're already giving back uh, uh, quite a bit through the foundation. But God did work some things here that he even called you deeper. I mean, he's a couple of major events in your life. You mentioned the cancer. But uh, at that time, uh, there was this this calling back to, to the Lord. You'd, you'd known Christianity since you were in Kentucky, but at the same time, you didn't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah, and you know, I had heard that my whole life. <clears throat> you know, I was baptized in a Southern Baptist church in, in uh, Gulf Breeze, Florida, when I was about 11. And my whole life, I would listen to these Baptist ministers talk about, you know, your personal relationship with Christ. And, and I'd, I never really felt that. You know, I just, ne I didn't quite understand what that meant. It just didn't, it, it hadn't occurred with me yet, and uh, but all it took was the, the melanoma, and uh, that really opened up a one-on-one -on -one dialogue, I would say, between uh, Christ and myself, I mean, just with prayer, and um, I felt like he was, he was answering me, and he was communicating me in, in, in his unusual ways, just through signs, and I would see things and, and look at things, and, and uh, I just felt like he was in my corner and that he was with me. And uh, so uh, my, my priorities really changed. And, you know, when, when you get to a point like that, you can't help but kind of ask the Lord, get me through this. And, uh, you know, I'm yours. Well, did that change the, uh, any of the focus of the T.W. Lewis Foundation at that time? You and Janet set this up. Well, it, it totally did. And our foundation really has evolved ever since we founded it in 2002. Mm -hmm. and we first started off giving scholarships to worthy uh, young high school students from uh, the Phoenix area that had a financial need and, and uh, similar to the scholarship that I got when I was at the University of Kentucky. But we would do 10 a year and we would interview 
about 40 students a year, and we really got to know these young young people, and they were great. But um, and so we started that way. But then we gradually began to open it up to what I called children and families in need, and that was really the Christian calling that you know it's our responsibility to take care of the poor, and you know in my experience uh, in the home building business and with the blue collar workers. And, but but also from Kentucky, in the time I spent in eastern Kentucky, with with devastating poverty up there, good people but terrible poverty, you know, it all kind of hit me then that, um, you know, when I got the cancer, that this was really the, the experience that God had for me to to put me through that to to make me sensitive to the people in need, and so we certainly began to expand our our philanthropy into other areas, and. Um, you know, one of them was enhancing the, uh, the, the, the support for the, for the poor. We, we really fought, uh, focused on foster children initially because mm-hmm. that was a real crisis in Arizona. And we got very involved in that. And then I opened up a category called Educating Our Youth. And, uh, and, and I could tell by interviewing all these high school kids. And also we had three you know, young sons, uh, and they're all great young men. But I could see how how these uh, young adults back in about 2010 were beginning to believe in some, in some popular mm-hmm. myths that were going to, that were not true. You know, this idea of find your passion and do what you love and live your dream. And that's all that matters. And, and, and uh, I could just see that things were changing. So mm-hmm. we, I wanted to focus on, on educating our young people the way I felt they should be educated. And, and that has since evolved into really, Christian ministry, because in today's world, that's the message that we really need to give our young adults. And so organizations like Young Life and Fellowship of Christian Athletes and many, many others uh, are out there doing that. And, you know, the the spirit of Christ is alive and well in America. It doesn't get a lot of publicity. <laughs> sure. or a lot, but, but when you get into that world, you see that there are a lot of people <clears throat> that are actively uh, you know, faithful and and sure. spreading the word and deep yeah. deep believers and that's a huge community and it needs to be a lot bigger you know we're getting kind of trampled on right now uh, in, in a lot of different ways so I've expanded yeah. even further uh, you know into into national organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom that that supports uh, religious freedom in the courts yeah there there's a I mean we look at these life experiences that uh, and some of these uh, character issues that you, you were involved in long before uh, you really rededicated everything to the Lord. I mean, there was hard work, prep, character, success, happiness. These were all signposts for your life before you really rededicated things to the Lord. And uh, mm-hmm. you've carried those over now to, uh, to this, the, the book, Solid Ground. Yeah. I mean, you, you lay out right. some, some really strong things for young people to take a look at. I do. <clears throat> and... Um... You know, I would always ask these high school students, um, <clears throat> how important is career success to you? Mm-hmm. And um, <clears throat> initially, back in the early 2000s, they would always say very important or, or it's everything. <clears throat> but then I, around 2010, I started noticing a different answer. And they all had the same answer. And it, here's what it was. Well, it's kind of important, but not so important that I would give up my happiness. So they think there's... So they, a battle between happiness and success. Right, that you can't have both, you have to choose one. And, and the message that they were getting was, don't work, you know, work smarter, not harder, 30 is the new 20, take it easy, have fun. Mm-hmm. It's all about entertainment and, uh, and pleasure. And then, uh, and then uh, eventually, you know, you, you, can, you can do what you love and, and you'll find success, but don't work too hard because primarily focus on being happy. And, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the best quote about happiness is uh, the more you, it's like a butterfly. The more you, you chase it, the, the more elusive it becomes. Happiness is not something you chase. Happ- happiness is something that naturally occurs, and it has nothing to do with success. And so that's a big point, but uh, that's why I saved that for last. <laughs> yeah, I, I was talking to a college professor the other day, and he, he was talking about uh, all the things online that college students can go to to basically cheat, get their papers written, uh, get answers for their test, uh, get uh, get some of these things. Some of these people will, will do everything for them, 
But they think they don't think they, there's anything wrong with that. They think that that's just being smart and uh, they don't have to work as hard. And therefore, they'll, they'll achieve the college degree without really putting the work in. I think that character flaw has really kind of pervaded uh, uh, mm -hmm. our, our society. Yeah. Well, you know what's really happened? Uh, I was reading about this the other day. Uh, I've been reading C.S. Lewis lately. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, good but we, America is losing its moral authority as we lose our religion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and today, you know, there's a strong difference between people of faith that have, in the case of Christianity, our moral authority comes from, from God, from Christ. And it's in the Bible, and it's, it, it, it does a very good job of explaining those traits, you know, I think. And Jesus was the best role model we could ever have. But today, students and young adults are being taught that, you know, uh, rigid character traits are, are, are not the way to go. It's better to focus on your feelings, what you feel uh -huh. in your heart. So you're your own moral authority. Whatever you feel is right. People think, well, that's just the Christianity of pushing these traits on people. We really don't need these right. traits of integrity and honesty and compassion right. and things like that. It's just right. a, a, the, the church is pushing that on people. Young right. people don't need that today. What I learned was that the secular world uh, does d d absolutely feels like you know, strict character traits is, is Christianity uh, dogma. It's pushing them to, be, to, to fit into the rigid uh, box of, of Christianity, which is not even close to the truth. And so, but that's how it's being messaged to young adults. Tom Lewis believes values and ethics matter, so much so he put his thoughts in this book. In a moment, he's going to share some of his keys to living a, a successful life, regardless of your income. That when we come back. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Placey to let everyone know that the Bible is still relevant today. Viewpoint is not only available on TV44's powerful broadcast stations and cable systems covering Northwest Ohio, but additionally, anyone can watch programs and exclusive bonus features on YouTube. And we've expanded Viewpoint's reach as you can now listen at work or in your car on the Viewpoint with Bob Lacey podcast. Would you like to help expand our reach? Then sign into YouTube with your account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now could do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places even missionaries can't reach. Help us today reach the world. Share Viewpoint with Bob Lacey today. Your book lays out a whole mm -hmm. series of character traits. Is that is that how else is it different? I wanted to go back and and, and tell what I thought was the real story, mm -hmm. the real truth about what it takes to succeed, and I and I went into some depth about just the, the work that it takes. I mean, sure. everything you you want to accomplish is going to take ten times the effort that you think it will. And that that story I told about is this the best you can do? You know? Yeah. Uh, so many people turn in their homework on the first go around and they, they think they're done. I mean, and people that people do that at work, you know, they, they do something once and they think they're done. But, you know, if you really want to, to, to succeed in this world, you have to keep raising the bar on yourself and, and make things better. And, you know, it's not about great success is not about great ideas. It's about constant improvement. 
I, I love the story you tell about Her Henry Kissinger in your book about is this the best you can do? And people are going to have to get that book and read, read some of those stories because there's some great ones in there. There's some great ones. I want to ask, I want to ask you, uh, as you've dealt with young people, I mean, you've, you've been given scholarships for years and, and uh, the, the foundation's changed a little bit. What do you think's changed the most in the beliefs and attitudes of 18-year-olds from maybe when we were growing up, 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, to 18-year-olds today? What do you think has changed the most in their attitudes and beliefs? What's some of the myths they're believing? Well, um, first of all, I think social media has, has had a massive uh, impact mm -hmm. on 18-year-olds today, and it's really, uh, really harming them. Um, I'm very involved with uh, several universities, uh, and uh, all of them tell me that there are, there are students today, between 35 and 50 percent of college students today are taking anxiety medications. Wow. You know, and, and I mean that that's a scary thought right there. It is. But they are not happy. They're anxious. They're they're all the all these universities. I get emails from them all the time. They're 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 setting up uh, counseling sessions for students who are don't know how to handle their emotional problems. There's all this uh, uh, social media pressure about you know be thinner, be better looking, be uh, be like all the the Hollywood stars are. But but the but but and that's just uh, unfortunate. I, you know I'm, I'm glad I, that I avoided that, and I'm glad my my three sons avoided that. But but the real myth that, that, that I believe are the strongest ones are, first of all, this idea that follow your passion and do what you love and everything will just work out. Okay. Yeah. And you know, and I tell the story about how I how my passion was football, but I'm five nine and not that fast and you know, and reasonably athletic, but nothing great. So had I followed my passion, I'd have been a total failure. Yeah, tell me, tell so, me that story again. What the coach, what the coach said to you about about following yeah, that passion. That's, funny. That, that's a uh, great story. Yeah, Coach Dan Haley. I went up to him after school one day. I said, Coach, you think I should play college football? And he looks at me with that fatherly football coach look, and he says, Lewis, how tall are you? And I said, five nine. He said, How fast are you in the hundred? And I said, Under twelve seconds. And he said, Well, let me ask you a question. If you line up at cornerback, which is what I played, against a, a 6'3 receiver that runs a 10 flat 100, and you got to guard him all the way to the goal line, what are you going to do? <laughs> and, and, you know, it's kind of obvious. And I said, well, I guess I'll just go to Kentucky and major in engineering. You know? <laughs> uh, so, but, but, but so following your passion is just not good advice. And, and right. uh, the other thing is that you can be anything you want. And you can't be anything. You know, my, Michael Jordan couldn't be a baseball player even. Um, you know, I couldn't. I couldn't have been a pro athlete. Um, but so we all have our talents, and, that, and that's a that's a God inspired thought. I mean, we all together have our unique talents on this on this planet, and together we make up a world. And you know, and, and each of us can contribute. So finding your talent, what are you really good at naturally, with little or no effort? That's the best advice I think you can give a young adult. And then, uh, and then this idea that most young adults today are scared to death to take risk. And my own personal view of that is that the news is so, you know, uh, mm -hmm. everywhere. And there's always bad news. You know, fires right. breaking out, bombs going off, people getting slaughtered in Walmarts. I mean, all this terrible stuff. And then they're – and – and the, the phrase, you know, be safe has is, is become kind of the, the, the new uh, salutary or, or, mm -hmm. the, or the new, you know, be safe out there. You know? yeah. So don't take the risk is the message that they mean. Don't take risk. And, uh, and, and, and really, you have to take risk to succeed. And risk is part of life and adversity is part of life. So I think young adults today are, are afraid of adversity. They don't know how to handle it. And, and I think the story I tell that I think is so important is what I'll call the uh, <clears throat> the adversity self-esteem cycle. And it's, it starts out with try something hard, fail, get back up, <clears throat> try it again, repeat. Eventually you'll succeed. In doing that, you will become, you will have encountered adversity, you will become resilient and your self-esteem will go up. 
But you can, your self-esteem cannot go up by reading a book on self-esteem or taking a class. You have to do things that are esteemable. And one of those is, is, is tackling difficult assignments. And yeah, I, I like uh, one of the points you made about uh, teaching your children to be uncomfortable and, and to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That that's something right. they need to learn as they grow up. And we, we, want, we want to shield them from all of that. We want them all to be comfortable, right. have everything that we, we never had. And uh, right. some, some of this goes back right. to how parents have been told that they need to raise their kids. Yeah, let them fail. That's the hardest thing to do with children is let them fail. But in, in, a, you know, in an age-appropriate way, mm -hmm. uh, they need to be able to learn to stand on their own two feet. Yeah, I, I, want, to, I want to share something that, that's in your book. It's from a, a sociologist, uh, Charles Murray did a study, he was searching to reveal the root cause of, of a lot of the disturbing trends that we see in America since 1960. Some of these trends that he, that he documented, he says a reduction in marriage rates, increase of, uh, of out of wedlock births, an increase in able men not seeking work, which we see a lot, a decrease in church affiliation and attendance, decrease in community engagement, a decrease in happiness, and he says there's a correlation now between that and uh, drug addiction, opioid, opioid addiction, foster children, the feeling of isolation and loneliness. And he, he, he documented all that. Do you think this can be reversed? And how do, we, how do we reverse it? I mean, your book lays out a way if, if, if young people going into high school would get into this book I th and start believing that instead of the myth, it could be reversed. But how else do you see this being reversed? Well, you know, I, I think God's going to have to handle it, mm -hmm. you know, and um, <clears throat> it's too big a problem for uh, any government program. Uh, I think we all just have to keep uh, keep the faith. But um, but the trends are really all going in the wrong way. And if there's anything positive that I see out there today, I mean, I'm talking about today, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. that we're kind of hitting rock bottom. You know, this this hopelessness, mm -hmm. which is the which is the worst uh, thing in the world is to is to be hopeless. But um, so many people in America are on welfare. Uh, Eighty-four percent of blacks are born out of wedlock. I think whites are now up to like forty percent. You know, when you and I were were kids, it was zero percent. Right. You know, That's born right. out of wedlock. But but you know, I asked a lady one time who who works with foster children, thousands of them in Arizona. And I said, how many of these foster children? come from intact families. And she said, she was shocked, and she said, none of, none them. of them. I mean, they all come from mm -hmm. out of birth, uh, out of wedlock births. And so that's a terrible way to start life. That's not fair. That's not right. Uh, but that's become the new norm. And so until we can reverse that, uh, I, I think it's going to be hard. But we're, we're going to have to hit rock bottom. Well, you mentioned that hitting rock bottom, that's sort of, I mean, we, we got a society that's, Right now, you look around and say, yeah, we're, we're coming to the rock bottom. We're, we're, we're hitting that. That's the same thing that happens in a, in a single person's life. When they finally hit rock bottom and they're broken, at that point in time, yeah. God can deal with them. Yeah, that's, that's what alcoholics have to do. Mm -hmm. you know? So maybe and, that's, uh, that's what we have to do with the society. It's gotten to the worst point where maybe the society's broken enough <clears throat> that God says, I can deal with it now. I can, I can get their attention. Yeah. But you know we have to let we have to let God back into the picture, and uh, it, it's such a shame I think that our government is 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 forcing it out so much, and um, mm -hmm. and so it you know that's a, that's a, that's what's got to change really. We have we got to it really started when we took uh, God out of school, and we took the flag out of school, and um, and our you know our schools just stopped teaching. Uh, you know right now. Um, you know, schools are are teaching anti-racism and and the and the the history of lynchings in the South and all these kind of polarizing, terrible subjects. But they're not they're not teaching any of the history that that that, that creates heroes. You mm -hmm. know, one of the questions I would ask our scholarship students, and then I got tired of asking it because it was who are your heroes? Oh. And I when I would ask them who are their heroes they would kind of get this deer in the headlights look on their faces and they couldn't think of anybody. They hadn't been taught. And then, yeah. Huh? And they hadn't been well, taught. Was, some of the heroes yes. are. And then they would, they usually say, well, or my mom or my dad, but 
there were no heroes. They didn't say Abraham Lincoln. They didn't say Mickey Mantle. They didn't say uh, anybody. You know, they, 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 could, they couldn't think of anybody that was their hero. Yeah. And so that's a shame. I mean, but, but now that same group of people is taking anxiety medication, you know, 45 to 50% of them, and they're not happy. Because they're they're focusing too much on themselves. What I, what I say in the book really is is it, in a in a nutshell is self absorption, instant gratification, and consumerism. Those are the big problems. I'll say that again. First of all, self absorption, mm-hmm. focusing on yourself. That is not how you make yourself happy. You and I talk about that in the book. Is focusing outwardly will make you a lot. Focusing on other people. Helping other people will make you happy. Helping yourself will not. Um, and then, uh, you know, instant gratification. You, you know, you can't just do what makes you feel good all the time. You got to to do the hard things first. And finally, consumerism. You know, when you watch television, these ads drive me crazy. I mean, yeah. this, this, these products and then these people that are advertising, it's like, are you kidding me? I mean, it's like the message is buy this gadget and you will be cool you yeah. know and you have to have it and it's just uh it's a terrible message and, and uh but but to spend your whole day uh surfing amazon to see what to think that the next thing you buy is going to make you happy it's not going to happen it's not going to happen well well tom the the book is is great it's called solid ground i would recommend parents uh, you read it yourself but get it for all of your preteens and your teenagers it's not, an, it's not a uh, typical success book. It's how to build character. It's how to succeed in life and how to build a successful marriage, a successful business, a su- 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 successful family. But, Tom, uh, how, how do people get the book? It's called Solid Ground. How will they get it? <clears throat> yes, well, it's on Amazon. Uh, mm-hmm. You can go there. It's available in hardback, ebook, and audio book. And you can also go to our book website called solidgroundbook.com. And you can uh, and you can do that do the same thing there. So it's available. It's out there. Uh, it's well worth the time. It, it's uh, I think it, there's a lot of truth in it. There's a lot of uh, great quotes, and I've really tried. I've always loved quotes, and quotes to me are something to, that should inspire you. And I, I think this book is an inspirational message. Uh, uh, and and there's a lot of great quotes in there, and uh, a lot of great stories. Thanks to Tom Lewis for sharing his viewpoint on today's program. His book, Solid Ground, is available online and in many bookstores. Again, I'd appreciate it if you'd remember Viewpoint Monthly in your financial giving. Our program is not something that can be supported by advertisers, so we count on your monthly gifts to keep Viewpoint growing. Thanks again. I'll see you next week. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast, on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.